In this video, we're going to be discussing insurance operations. This is from Chapter 6 of the Rada McNamara text. Let's begin with an overview of insurance company functions, and this will also serve as an outline for today's lecture. First, underwriting. Insurance companies engage in underwriting, which is one of the most critical functions of an insurance company. Next, production and distribution, which cannot be underestimated as an important part of insurance. We've already discussed this in the last lecture in the marketing system section. Then, rate making or actuarial. Next, claims. And then, reinsurance. Investing, accounting, electronic data processing, and computer modeling. But I would say that these first five things Underwriting production and distribution, rate making claims, and reinsurance are all unique to insurance, and they're also part of what I would call the core functions. While other companies underwrite and other companies certainly engage in marketing or production, the way it's done in insurance is very unique. Rate making is really just pricing, and claims is highly unique to the insurance business, as well as reinsurance. Then these other areas, investing, accounting, electronic data processing, and computer modeling are all extremely important in the insurance business, and we'll talk about each one of these later. Let's begin looking at underwriting. Underwriting defined is the process of selecting and classifying insureds, or sometimes insured exposures. Classifying means putting insureds into rating classes that are of similar risk. Companies use various underwriting criteria to determine riskiness. For example, if you're underwriting homeowner's insurance, we saw some of the rating factors that insurance companies used when we looked at the declarations page in our discussion of analysis of insurance contracts. Type of construction, year built, fire class or fire protection code, all of these things are very important in determining the class of risk but one of the most important things is loss history. You can see more examples with respect to car insurance rating factors at this article that I actually wrote for carinsurancelist.com. Take a look at it as you might find something in this article on your quiz. Underwriting is also not just the accept or reject decision and it's also known as binding or having the pen. The reason it's called binding is because it's binding the insurance company to the risk that the policy is being written upon. So anyone who is an underwriter has binding authority. Insurance agents sometimes also have binding authority as we discussed in the last lecture. Now let's talk about some underwriting principles. First, every underwriter, whether an agent or a company underwriter, should follow the company guidelines. Every company has their own appetite for risk, so different companies' underwriting guidelines are going to be different. Some companies, for example, might be targeting a slightly higher risk group, whereas other companies are less likely to attract the higher risks. The other thing that's important in underwriting is to achieve equity in rate classes. Let's look more closely at this. Equity in rate classes basically means that you want to put high risks with high risks and low risks with low risks. So for example, you wouldn't put this house in the same rating class with this house because this first house looks rather dilapidated and not well taken care of, whereas this one appears to be in pristine condition. So even though they may be of the same construction type, you wouldn't want them in the same rating class. The reason being that you would expect the first one to have a higher rate of loss than the second one. And so it wouldn't be fair to insureds in the second class to be paying the same insurance premium for those in the first class. Now let's talk about who underwriting professionals are. As we talked about, the agent or the agency is often an underwriter. This is only the case when the agent has binding authority or the pen which is the ability to issue a binder on behalf of a company. Some agents, as we discussed, have binding authority only for one company, while others, known as independent agents, may have binding authority for many companies. Agents are also known as the field underwriter when they underwrite insurance risk. The insurance company must be careful to realize that an agent's underwriting could be biased. 
for a couple of reasons. One, the agent generally stands to gain from underwriting a risk because they make a commission on that risk. Secondly, the agent may be less likely to turn away a friend or someone that they know well. These agents generally live in the communities and work around a lot of the people that are being underwritten, so they may be less likely to turn away a higher risk than a company. On the other hand, the agent is more aware of the riskiness of every insured most of the time because they know them better than an underwriter who's sitting in a home office far removed from the risk. Then there are company underwriters. First, there's the staff underwriter. Staff underwriters do the physical underwriting. Oftentimes, you would start out as an assistant underwriter, and that would be a staff underwriter. But eventually, you could move up to be a line underwriter or underwriting manager. Staff underwriters report to the line underwriters or underwriting managers. Line underwriters generally do not do day-to-day -day underwriting. But when a risk is a little more complicated and doesn't fit within the typical company guidelines, the staff underwriter may need to turn to the line underwriter for advice or input. Line underwriters have the interesting opportunity to make determinations about where the company should be focusing their writings, and they work closely with the insurance agency force to make those determinations. Next, production and distribution. As we discussed, production and distribution is really the marketing, so it's the intermediary that brings the company and the insureds together. And these include independent agents and exclusive agents. Realize that these professionals are not just selling insurance. In fact, most large property and casualty brokers today have loss prevention, or sometimes called loss control departments, where they actually go in and help their insureds manage their risk to reduce their total loss experience and even some smaller agencies do. I think that it will become more and more common for agencies to engage in loss prevention. This will become an expected service of insurance agents and brokers. If you have a desire to work as a risk manager, large brokerages are actually a good place to at least start. Next, rate making. Rate making is actually pricing insurance. It's where individuals known as actuaries determine what to charge for an insurance policy. Actuaries use loss statistics and mathematical formulas to determine the loss cost aspect of the rate. In other words, the amount of the insurance charge that is expected to pay for policyholders' losses. So what are insurance rates based on? Well, of course, they're based on losses, which are a big unknown. This makes pricing of the insurance business very different than pricing in most other industries, where pricing in many other industries is actually based on known factors, or relatively known factors, such as labor costs, materials cost, and even sometimes storage costs. Then there's loss adjustment expenses, or claims-related expenses. These are also somewhat unknown because you may not know how much it's going to take to determine the amount of loss and to get the loss paid. It also might include providing a defense to the insured, which again could be a very big unknown. Additionally, insurance rates are based on commissions, which are typically set as a percentage of the insurance premium. Also, administration costs and underwriting costs which is the cost of paying the underwriter as well as collecting the data and other administrative related costs. Next, premium taxes and fees that go generally to the state government. And profits. These generally average 30% of the total premium. Finally, investment earnings, at least in property and liability, is not directly considered as part of the rate that is charged, but it is considered by the insurance company. Sometimes insurance rates actually are set to lose money in terms of underwriting. Sometimes insurers actually pay out more in losses and loss adjustment expenses than they take in in premiums. But the investment earnings that they make on money they hold until they pay for losses makes up for that difference. Keep in mind that state rate regulation plays an important part in actuarial rating. The state government says that rates must be adequate, not excessive, and not unfairly discriminatory. Every state has a law that says this, and we'll talk more about this when we cover government regulation of insurance. Some states even have what's called prior approval. 
which says that insurance companies cannot use rate changes until the state government insurance department approves those rate changes. Let's talk a little bit about life rates versus property rates versus liability rates. Life insurance is based on a predictable type of loss. And of course, most losses don't occur for a long time. As we'll discuss when we get to our conversations about life insurance, the expectation of mortality rates or death rates of people born in the same year and of the same sex, non-smokers versus smokers, is very predictable. So insurance companies can be fairly accurate in their rates as long as they have a large number of insurers. And also, most losses don't occur for a long time. Life insurance policies are typically in force for a long time. Even term policies might be in force for 20 or 30 years. And whole life policies are likely in force for even longer. Property is much less predictable. Losses are shorter term. This is also known as short tail, which is three to five years. The tail in insurance is the time from the accident to full loss payment. Personal property is even shorter, being, being one to three years. In other words, if a person has a loss from roof damage, it might take one year for the full payment to be paid out under the claim. In terms of liability, this is even less predictable. So of the three, it would be the least predictable, and the lost tail can be 10 to 15 years and even higher. What this means is that it might take a very long time for the actuary to know whether or not their loss predictions were correct. So this is a fairly difficult area to price. Now let's discuss claims. Claims is also known as loss adjustment. There are several different types of adjusters. First, Sometimes the insurance agent gets involved in claims adjusting. Oftentimes this will be the first person an insured or policyholder calls after having a loss, and they may be required to collect certain information about the claim to send to the company. So they do get involved, but rarely do they make the final claim decision. Then there's a company adjuster. Many companies actually have adjusters that are out in the field that will pay claims as they occur. They may or may not go to the site of the claim, or in the case of auto insurance, they might go to the body shop to adjust the claim. Then there's independent adjusters. Independent adjusters work for the insurance companies when the insurance companies don't have their own adjusters, either because it's a remote location or because the company chooses to just use independent adjusters. But independent adjusters are contracted by the company. There are large adjusting firms who specialize only in claims adjusting, oftentimes in a specific type of claims adjusting, like workers' compensation or some type of property adjusting. And then there's a public adjuster. The public adjuster works for the policyholder and becomes involved when there's a dispute over the claim payment. They work with the company adjuster or independent adjuster to come up with a acceptable claims amount to all parties. And as I've mentioned before, how to handle any dispute is actually explained in the conditions of the insurance policy. Then there's a company investigator. Company investigators get involved in claims only when there's a suspicion of fraud or there might be a question in a liability case of whether or not the insured is at fault for the loss. There's also catastrophe claim specialists. These individuals are basically independent adjusters who specialize in catastrophe losses. And a catastrophe doesn't have to be something like a hurricane or a tornado. It could actually just be a series of events like from wildfires or a bad set of winter storms where a claim specialist will go to the area and handle claims because there's too many claims for the insurance company adjusters to handle. As you can imagine, it wouldn't be efficient for an insurance company to keep on hand the number of adjusters that they would need in a catastrophe situation. Therefore, catastrophe claim specialists are often called in whenever there is any kind of catastrophic loss. And lawyers are also very important in the claims adjusting process. As we've discussed, lawyers get involved when there's a liability situation and they're called upon to defend the insured and the claim. Because the insurance transaction involves a contract, lawyers might be involved in other situations as well. Additionally, if there's a dispute, a lawyer might need to become involved. Let's look at the steps in the claim settlement process. First, the insurance company will get notice of loss from the insurer 
who is required to provide prompt notice of loss. Second, they need to conduct any investigation that's needed. As I've said, they might come out and look at the house. They would collect information from the insured. They might go to the scene of an accident and look at the damage to a car, for example. There might be court cases involved. Again, they might go to the scene of the accident and they might actually conduct an investigation of the claim, such as this might be a worker's compensation claim and the worker is continuing to collect lost wages for a back injury, but they're found to be lifting and engaging in other activities that indicate they don't actually have a back injury. Next, you would get a sworn statement from the insured, which may be part of the investigation, but is an extremely important part of the claim settlement process. And finally, you would handle disputes as stated in the policy. Now let's look at reinsurance. Not every company purchases reinsurance, but in this age of global business and with the set of catastrophes that we've had in the last 20 or 30 years, most companies today do buy reinsurance to protect themselves. Let's start with some definitions. Reinsurance can be defined as insurance on insurance policies. So let's look at the reinsurance transaction. First, there's the insurer. When participating in the insurance transaction, the insurer is known as the sedent. They buy the reinsurance from the reinsurer to protect themselves. The reinsurer is actually sort of the insurer or the insurance carrier in the reinsurance transaction. And by the way, a reinsurer doesn't have to specialize in only reinsurance. Many companies whose names you probably are aware of, like Hartford and Travelers, also engage in reinsuring other companies. The reinsurance transaction is called a session, where the insurance company cedes a portion of insurance risk to the reinsurer. Now let's look at the different types of reinsurance. This will help you understand the reinsurance transaction even better. First, let's focus on facultative versus treaty reinsurance. Facultative reinsurance is a reinsurance contract on just one policy. The insurer cedes coverage on one building, for example. Under treaty reinsurance, the reinsurer assumes the risk of many policies. The insurer cedes coverage on losses from an entire book of business, for example, on many buildings. Another way to classify reinsurance as either pro rata or excess of loss. Pro rata reinsurance is a proportional sharing of risk. The reinsurer assumes a portion of every loss under the contract. This might sound complicated, but it really isn't. It's similar to how coinsurance works in healthcare. So a 30% pro rata reinsurance contract would look like this. The reinsurer would assume 30% and the sedent or insurance company keeps 70% of the exposure. So for a thousand dollar loss, the sedent would pay $700 of that loss and the reinsurer would assume 30% or $300. Excess of loss is where the reinsurer assumes risk in excess of the insurer's or sedent's retention. In essence, the retention is like a large deductible. Say, for example, there's a $700,000 excess of $300,000 reinsurance treaty. It would look like this. The insurer or sedent would retain $300,000. The reinsurer assumes anything excess of $300,000. So if the loss was $400,000, the sedent would pay $300,000 of the loss and the reinsurer would pay $100,000. If the loss was $800,000, the sedent would pay $300,000 and the reinsurer would pay $500,000. They would pay everything up to $700,000. If the loss was, for example, $1,200,000, the reinsurer would only pay $700,000 and the sedent would have to pay the $500,000 difference. So reinsurance can be facultative pro rata, facultative excess of loss, or treaty pro rata or treaty excess of loss. Now let's look at why insurance companies even use reinsurance, the basic functions and uses of reinsurance. First, Reinsurance increases the ability of insurers to write new business. 
Insurer's ability to write business is based on their ratio of premium to surplus. Surplus is the difference between their liabilities and assets, or assets minus liabilities. As you can imagine, insurance companies have to have a certain amount of surplus to support their premium writings in case their losses exceed what's expected. The surplus is, if you will, a cushion to protect the insurance companies and the insureds against losses being higher than the insurance company expected. Reinsurance can reduce premium and increase surplus. The simplest way to put it is that insurance companies are transferring some of the risk that they've assumed to the reinsurer. Additionally, reinsurance stabilizes losses and especially catastrophic losses. Often insurance companies will purchase a reinsurance contract on a group of risks that are in a catastrophe exposed area and the way the insurance works is on a per event basis. So, if you have XYZ insurance company who has a concentration of homeowners policies in South Louisiana, once the losses on a specific hurricane reach a certain level, maybe $10 million, then the reinsurance contract kicks in. Also, reinsurance might be needed to gain underwriting advice and other types of operational advice. If an insurance company especially is getting into a new area of insurance business or writing a new type of risk, they might reinsure a significant portion of it with a reinsurance company that has a lot of experience in that area. Now let's look at other essential insurance company functions. I mentioned these before. Accounting. Insurance companies are required to report their financials on a different accounting basis than any other company. The type of accounting insurance companies have to use is called statutory accounting. And this is extremely important both because insurance is a very financial transaction and because it's highly regulated and regulators require these accounting statements. Next, investments. As we discussed, the investments for an insurance company can be a significant source of their profits, so they have to have a strong and successful investment department. Electronic data processing. Insurance companies process an enormous amount of data, both in terms of who and where their insureds are located and also in terms of losses that they've experienced and paid for. And then related to electronic data processing is computer modeling. Much of the data that insurance companies collect is input into special computer models which can help to determine what the insurance company's exposure actually is going forward. And finally, there's one more function in the modern day insurance industry, and that is risk management. Nearly every large insurer and broker has a significant risk management function or department since 2000. As I've mentioned in prior lectures, these days insurance companies are called upon to focus on more than just insurance or risk transfer and to look at their insured's entire risk profile or to engage in enterprise risk management. I think this is a very positive step in the insurance business. And that's the end of our discussion of insurance operations.